Glue Wednesday. You see, it's my belief that we don't have to get over. We need to find ways to keep it together. And my glue is G-L-U-E. God's love undoes everything because that's what keeps it together. That life is about going from one puzzle to the next. You're either a small, medium, or large piece of each puzzle in your family, social, or business relationships. Yet, yet, no matter what size puzzle piece you think you are, without you, the puzzle is labeled as incomplete. Hi, and welcome to Glue Wednesday. I named it Glue Wednesday because so often the cliche is for Wednesday is hump day. And I feel that hump has the connotation of the need to get over and the clock's not running. And so, so, in, so what I decided to do was give it a positive twist and call it glue. Because Wednesday is traditionally the middle of a seven day week cycle, seven days a week cycle, and it's the middle that keeps the end and the, and the weekend and the beginning together. So that's why I call it the glue. My name is Sporty King, and therefore I want to let you know that I didn't start out by saying my name, so I'm okay with that. But that, that's why I want you to know that it's so important to find ways to keep it together. Because for that instance, I didn't have it together. And, I, and why do I bring that up? Because so often what we have to do and recognize and realize and then admit is that we don't have it all together. And that's one of the things I'm going to be talking about today in my show. The fact that we don't always have it together and sometimes we need to find another way to make it together. So as you think about GLUE, also realize G-L-U-E stands for God's love undoes everything. In other words, whatever is going on in your life that may be tearing apart, messing up your life, then you need God's love to bring it back together. And that becomes the glue that you can smile about. My topic for this broadcast is a combined one. I'm going to dedicate it to women as we close out Women's History Month. And after the first poem I'll share, I'll walk us into the related topic. So this first poem was written through the eyes of my seasoned citizens in Chicago. See, I used to do uh, a session called the um, Golden Brick Road for senior citizens in Chicago before I moved to Charlotte seven years ago. But I call them seasoned citizens because we're all seasoned with a little something different to make us go forward. In fact, our tagline used to always be, don't let anybody tell you that you're getting senile. Tell them you're exercising your right to forget. Because the truth is, we learn so much. Even computers forget, forget things. How can we be expected to remember everything that goes into our minds? But what happens is, when we have a, a spot where we forget something, we repress the thought by constantly beating ourselves up. Stupid me, I can't remember that. I can't believe I can't remember it. And we focus so, so much on the fact that we can't remember that we actually suppress the thought and then it won't come to memory. So sometimes when you forget something, give it a good 5, 10 seconds. If you want to go 15 max, that's fine. And you don't remember it, ah, can't remember it, move on. And the next thing you know, you'll remember it because you've released yourself from that stress of having to know it. So this poem is called Women, W-O-M-E-N. And what we used to do in my sessions is I'd give, I'd give them a theme name. For the, for the poem, and they had to give me letters that began with that le with each letter of the word, and we made that into a poem. So you won't necessarily hear all the letters that begin with a W, O, M, E, or N in this poem, but you, hear, you will on the second poem, but I just want to point that out. So this is called Women. Can't live without them, period. And I wouldn't want to be the one to have to prove it. Thus, as I sat before the fireplace last night, my thoughts drifted to you. Not the words we exchanged during our last time together, but to you. And as I listened to the crackle of the wood, I was reminded of the crispness and effervescence of your smile. A glow of encouragement inspiring me to breathe and enjoy this walk of faith. Staring into the dancing flames, I saw the many faces of your beauties, of your beauty, and, send, and sensed your moods as I stare into the mirror we now share. Funny how it seems I have a message when I am merely the messenger. Clever how I mouth your words with no sight of your hand running up my back. Lasting your effect on the lives you touch, neither beginning nor ending with mine. Oh, I could go on and on, but I can't live without you. Period. And I was recently on a relationship panel here at the, the Wake Up Call Radio TV Network where we were discussing the challenge of dating. 
So I'll make that my related topic tonight, the challenge of dating. And as I walk us into it by repeating the double meaning of the last two, two lines of that poem. Oh, I could go on and on, but I can't live without you, period. See, the first meaning is that the first one is, is, is aligned with the listing of the wonderful things that women bring into the many lives of the people that they touch. The words, the smiles, the encouragement. But the second meaning is that the writer could continue to exist in this world, but not live without the right women in his life. And I was the writer in that case, but I, always, I talk about it in the third person because that should apply to everyone. And then I take us back to the second line that opens the poem. It says, and I wouldn't want to be the one to have to prove it. So no, we cannot live without women. And, and you have to value and, and, and appreciate the women in your life to the point where that message comes to them clearly. Because it's not about being the one to prove it. It's, 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 not, that, it's not that not being the one to prove it that I want to highlight tonight. I want to talk about the beauty and what could be misinterpreted or misperceived as a negative when we talk about dating being a challenge. The dictionary synonyms of challenge are dispute, dare, and defy. Yet also it, there's a definition of a stimulating or interesting task or problem. Challenge is just LL, is challenge is just change with an LLE in the middle. Think about it when you spell change, C-H-A-N-G-E, now spell challenge, C-H-A-N-L-L-E, no, C-H-A-L-L-E-N-G-E. -E. So sound challenge is just change with an L-L-E in the middle. So I'm going to um, um, put my message together by talking about all three words, challenge, change, and L-L-E. I'm going to break challenge down in three words. I'm going to break challenge down into trust, honesty, and expectations. I'm going to take change and break that down into priorities, children, and location. And LLE, life's learning experience, judgment, comparison, and baggage. And what I'll do is I'll start with the LLE, life's learning experiences. Because how they infuse, they, how they, are, they get infused into change, leading to challenge, is important. Consider this poem as introduced from my book, I Found Out I'm Dying, A Celebration of Life. And what I usually do is I, in, I introduce the poem so that people can understand how to use the poem in their lives. So often the challenge when we take a poetry class is in interpreting the poem, two people can be sitting next to each one another or another side of the room and read the same poem and they, one gives their interpretation, another gives theirs, and guess what? The teacher gets the last word? Why should the teacher necessarily be the one who knows what the poet was talking about? Sometimes that's how we sap the creativity from our children. Something like uh, interpreting a poem right. You could have a kid that's really creative and see something different in the poem versus what the textbook said the poem is about. So whenever I publish my poetry, I always have it in there so that somebody can get it right. The first time you read the poem, you may get your opinion of what the poem is about. Then when it's over, I will have given you some type of narrative to explain what I thought the poem was about, how, why I wrote the poem. Now guess what? You've got to read it a third time so that you can see what we think the poem should be about. But the bottom line is, at the end, you'll either say, oh, I did get it. And that could be what encourages you to move on with writing your poetry. We've all got a poem inside of us, but it gets snuffed out by somebody else telling us that it was silly. So here's how I introduced that poem. Oh, da -da -da -da. When do we recognize, okay, okay, I got it right here. Okay, I got it written wrong in the book. Okay, because I cut the ex I cut it down. What of that new relationship? See, the poem before Baggage Claim was about new relationships, how we don't want to go first. So what of that new relationship? What makes it so hard for us to go first? It's the experiences in our past relationships. Experiences that we choose to call pain rather than lessons. I don't deny that lessons can be painful, but each person is brought into our lives to help us take a step. Not always a step forward, because sometimes we need to reevaluate the road we're on. These lessons have also been called baggage. And I say that's fine. However, I like to affectionately call them such and recognize that as we unselfishly allow one another to work through our baggage, 
we work toward a better relationship that has a base of empathy. Thus the poem Baggage Claim. Be sure to reread this poem replacing the word baggage with lessons. But what I'm going to do is read the poem to you with the word lessons in it. So you replace lessons with baggage. So it's called baggage claim, but we're going to call it lessons claim. You see, actually, if you aren't carrying any lessons from your past, we may not have as much in common as we thought. For as surely as you have parents who had parents, who were born unto parents, who were sons and daughters of someone born into an imperfect world after being conceived by a woman who knew a man who had an opinion, <laughs> your lessons can be picked up at carousel number one. And don't you see, don't you see the, the, the play on words in there? We've all got baggage and we've all got lessons because every single one of us was born into a world. It's, a, it's already an imperfect world. We were born into a world by, uh, conceived by a man and a woman who also were conceived by a man and a woman. So that, that victorious cycle, I don't like to call it a vicious cycle, that victorious cycle of procreation is what gets us to the point where we misunderstand what somebody else is telling us. And that becomes what somebody calls baggage and you can call it your lesson. So pick up your lessons at carousel number one. You see, we've all got lessons that influence our judgment of others. And here's one of those judgmental sayings that we allow us to, ourselves to get away with, but it's really judgmental. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. That's judgmental. Because if you see someone who reminds you of somebody who scammed you, then you automatically put up a wall. One of my daily prayers is that I become less judgmental because I know I'll never make it to non being non-judgmental. If you have physical features, a voice tone, mannerisms, educational or street knowledge of someone who scammed, betrayed or hurt me, my guard will automatically and justifiably go up upon our first meeting. Now what I hope to do immediately is to be able to not extend my guard or, or my wall so high or so wide that you don't have the chance to come around or help me get over it and get over that bias or that flashback. So we hear the sayings and groupings of what men or women do or don't do, what men or women like or don't like, and, and, and we group them into research justifying staying away from all of them instead of remembering that we're looking for the exception to the rule, the needle in the haystack, the diamond in the rough. Even in the Bible's book of Genesis 18, 24 through 33, Abraham started a conversation with God by asking, suppose you find 50 innocent people. He was talking about in Sodom and Gomorrah. Will you spare it for their sakes? By 1830, by 1833 in Genesis, he had gone from 50 to 45 to 35 to 30 to 20, to finally 10. And the Lord said that he would not destroy the city if he could find the smallest number of innocent people. So in other words, the mate you're looking for is not among the many. If you give up, you're actually giving up on yourself. If you research men, you will never find the man that you're looking for, and vice versa. Don't point to the crowd in disfavor. You were once a part of it. And that's neither good or bad. We start out as a number and we evolve into the person. Speaking of numbers, did you see that there were seven numbers to complete Abraham's conversation? 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, 20, 50, 45, 40, 35, uh, 30, 20, and 10. Seven is the number of completion. Sometimes what you have to do is, is, again, when you talk about thinking outside the box, be creative and think outside and start to look for those little things that bring closure. So seven is the number of completion. So seven times is what, what Abraham asked God for something before he finally recognized this conversation is over. But meanwhile, that judgment is based on comparison. And yes, you'll compare past relationships to new ones. Please remember to include, to include yourself in the comparison. Who you were and where you were in your spiritual walk uh, with your life at that time. Who were you and where were you in your spiritual walk at that time? You were attracted to the person who you say broke your heart. Now why is that now the crowd's fault? So we have to really start to remember to put ourselves into every equation. And that leads us to change. You were attracted to that person based on your priorities, children's status, and location. 
Priorities? Well, your priorities in terms of your career, your education, your financial, your social, and your spiritual priorities. And I put them in alphabetical orders because the truth is priorities, you have to decide what order you put your priorities in. Whether you put them in alphabetical orders or you put them in, in according to what you need. Children, the reason children become a part of change, well, did or do you have any children? Did you, do you want any children? Does the other person want children? And see how that reconnects us back to the priorities? Because if you already have children, or if the other person has children, that may determine whether or not you want to get involved with somebody who has children. Now you have to be careful of the pre, um, um, prejudging the person and deciding that if they've got children, that they've got baby mama or baby daddy drama based on what you've allowed the media to tell you or your friends based on their experience. And then when should, and if you, and if they have children, and if you do, when should your children meet your mate? That's something that you've got to make a decision about. How are you as a role model if you're the parent? That's going to be important. So that's going to impact you. How old were you? And how mature are you? And also that connects us to the judgment of the crowd. So sometimes, again, we think that, you know, that the crowd is the problem. It's never the crowd. Because the crowd is only there to be an influence if you're willing to follow it. Choose your messengers carefully and recognize that you're one of the messengers as well. And why does lo what does location have to do with priorities? Well, uh, the, the location, you need to know, does a long distance relationship work? Doesn't work for everybody. Takes a lot of security to make it work and a, lot of, and a little dab of insecurity for it to be unsuccessful. But that's not always the reason. It really comes down to the circumstances. And what happens if your mate moves? So you may not go into a, automatically into a long distance relationship, but what happens if, if it turns out that they move for some reason? Maybe it's career uh, reason, or maybe they move because they have an ill parent and they have to move to take care of them. Let's not instantly make a decision that people are um, ruining our lives. And do you travel? Location, do you travel enough to meet people with different backgrounds and exposing situations? Your exposure is going to make a difference in your priorities. Okay? Put those experiences into change and you'll get your challenge. And my three words for challenge, we're going to talk about our trust, our honesty, honesty and expectations. Trust. Are all men really alike? Do all women really like the bad boys? Can you believe what you read on, in online dating? You see, you have to really decide what you trust so that you can move forward. But I'd rather hurry up and connect that to honesty. Because honesty is not always the same as trust. You see, I might trust a liar but not be able to be honest with a person that I can't trust. Most of us lie at the beginning of a relationship because we don't know if we can tell this person our deepest secrets. So we share a little at a time. Technically, it's lying. And then we get even, and then we can even understand why the person may not have given us the whole story when they get to that point where they can trust us and they tell us their little secrets. Haven't you done that? I gotta, I'm not going to tell you that I've poured out all of my, all of my secrets and all my backgrounds with every woman that I've met. Forget about dating, just met. And then even let's extend this not to just a, the love relationship. A relationship could also have to do with your job. It could, you know, it could also have to do with the people you work with, the people that you play with on a team. A relation, everything is a relationship. I know we're talking about the, the dating relationship, but start to see how your life is not always super segmented, but how each part of it touches the other parts. Because how you treat your mate will impact how you treat the, the, the same sex person, the opposite sex person at your job or on your team, or how you may feel about somebody's sexuality. See, all of these things start to come in. As, as we look at what the kids just recently did about the march for guns, safety, is that new? No, it's not new. It's just another reason for us to be aware of a situation that may need to be changed. And that could come into your, affect your relationship as well. So let's say that you're the, one of the, the parents who lost a child. That's going to change your dating situation somewhere down the line. And so let's take it up from a child, but let's say that you're a, a married couple and you lose your mate. How long does it take for you to start dating again? Well, where everybody's telling you, oh, you need to move on with your life. See, there's a lot of stuff that impacts us. And we've got to be open and willing to accept that and recognize how much we have to do with it. 
So again, we a lot of us may lie at the beginning, and but you know, and then we want to say, well, I wasn't really lying, I was just exaggerating. It doesn't matter how you look at it. Being a liar ain't the worst thing in the world. But the key is, I would much rather uh, trust a liar than be honest to someone that I can't trust. And if that, after we share the person, because if after we share our deepest secret, that person goes and tells the world or uses it against us, we restrict our open and honest sharing. So the bigger challenge is, do you trust yourself? And are you honest with yourself? Because that impacts your expectations. And then of course, that links us back to judgment. If you set an expectation of marriage, family, career, etc., way back when you were a teenager, and that hasn't happened, you may start not to trust your choices and your path. So you chisel away and you lower your wants and needs. Instead of realizing that those weren't always necessarily your expectations. They were your parents, your friends, your teachers, the movie stars who you watched. And they often were milestones to please other people before we grew into a person that we liked and wanted to be. And that person has painted a new picture of what they want. So let's get back to travel again. Exposure makes a difference in our, percept in our um, preferences. When you expand your circles, you expand your options. And notice that the first two letters and options are OP, open to possibilities. Especially the possibility of bringing the right person and people into your blessed life. Even a relationship is about changing our status from single to being coupled. We all change and we have to be willing to look at change as positive. I speak with the military through a program called the Yellow Ribbon Reintegration Program and I always tell my service members, don't expect to come back to the way things were. Expect to come home to the way they're going to be with new tools. Because everyone grows through a deployment. So, and a deployment is a physical separation. How often do we find ourselves in a physical separation just on vacation, you know, or just in, in the day, the day where you go to work one way and your spouse, significant other goes another way, you and your child. We're always deployed. We're always separated from someone. And in that time that we're separated and we're alone, we have a chance to grow. I wake up every morning and I always say that if I wake up the same person that I was yesterday, perhaps I never went to sleep. We all change. It's just how you have to decide to embrace change as the positive thing that it is. Life's learning experiences bring us to peace with change to help us accept challenge with excitement, not dread. So this closing poem was written through the eyes of my, also of my senior citizens, senior citizen, but in another center. I, I spoke in five different centers in Chicago. And their take on women may explain the period in the first poem. This poem is called Flame of Life. She stood out from the rest because she was mine. Oh, how I enjoyed her touch and soothing words, the way she handled me like no one else could or dared. What was mine has been hers since the day I recognized her, and our love has never ceased, only subsided. We, we've enjoyed the ups and downs, ins and outs, good and bad times. So often she's gone that extra mile with for me with no expectation or doubt. In fact, when you really get down to it, she's the one who knows what I'm all about. Though it hasn't been every waking moment of our lives, we've made up for the time we were apart. And I know that I'll always love her, not with words, but deep in my heart. She is wonderful, wise, and her thoughts are always with me. She is omnipresent and reminds me that she'll be there for me. She is Mary, Mary Ann, Mary, my one and only. She is energetic, my everlasting love. She is necessary, nice, nosy, it's true. She's a part of the flame of my life. Who is she to you? And you need to know that because the women in your life should be honored every month of every year. And the bigger picture is always about LLE, life's learning experience learning experiences because life is always going to be about going from one puzzle to the next. You're either a small, medium, or large piece of the puzzle in all of your family, social, and business relationships. Yet, no matter what size puzzle piece you see yourself as, without you, the puzzle is called incomplete. 
I'm Sporty King. This has been Glue Wednesday. I'll be back with you next Wednesday and then Thursday and then Friday because the thing is that life just doesn't stop. So don't you let anything stop your life. Uh, make sure that you honor the women in your life. Make sure that you accept the challenge of dating. But more importantly, make sure that you love yourself enough that you can give that energy to both of them. Thank you. God bless you.